California National Guard troops make their first public appearance today after arriving at the border as promised by Governor Brown. Our election coverage continues with a look at the race for district attorney, candidate voting records, and what exactly our county assessor assesses. Uh, you, you name it, somebody's putting CBD into it. And legalization hasn't exactly been a boon for everyone in the pot business. Why some growers are turning to alternative crops. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. The district attorney's office is dropping charges against a Vista man whose arrest was captured in a disturbing video last week. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman reports from North County. Yeah, Ebony. Now, a neighbor shot video of that arrest in Vista, and the family says it shows the deputies physically abusing the two men. Since then, the sheriff's department has put two deputies on administrative assignment and say they're conducting an internal investigation. Now, Monday afternoon, Geraldo Martinez Sr. was in court to be arraigned, but the DA's office decided not to pursue charges against him. Martinez Sr. was facing a felony charge of resisting an officer by using force or violence. Both he and his son were arrested last week after the sheriff's department says they were responding to a domestic violence call. Now, the lawyer for the family believes the neighbor's video is what led to the charge against the father being dropped. They dismissed the case because of the video. Had it not been that an innocent bystander, a person who was watching what happened, this case would never have been dismissed. And so the DA's office would not say if that video played a role in their decision not to pursue the charge. Now, his son, Geraldo Martinez Jr., was also arrested last week on a number of charges, including false imprisonment and assault with a deadly weapon. Martinez Jr. will be in court for a readiness hearing this Friday. He's facing more than six years behind bars if convicted on all charges. The family and their attorney say they're pleading not guilty and will fight the charges. Also, the sheriff's department says they do have body camera video from the deputies during this arrest, but are withholding it pending the, the results of investigation. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. Thanks, Matt. The California National Guard is deploying along the border. The first guardsmen arrived in El Centro Monday with public fanfare. KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh has this report. The Guard has been quietly deploying to the border for over a week. This was their first public appearance here at El Centro Border Station this morning. No one from the Guard even spoke. Instead, the first 51 troops to arrive in El Centro filed in and stood in formation. Chief Border Patrol agent Gloria Chavez welcomed them and took a few questions. A total of 51 members of the California National Guard have arrived mostly about the complex rules for how the California Guard will operate under the rules laid out by Governor Jerry Brown, staying mainly in the background in support roles. They will be working cameras, they'll be working in offices, they'll be conducting intelligence analysis, they're going to be also helping us with road infrastructure with regards to vegetation, road clearing and such, but it's never going to be a frontline border security assignment or task. We're out here at the border where behind me they're starting to replace a section of fence. Now in years past the California National Guard has helped rebuild things like this wall. But under the complex rules of engagement they won't be doing anything like that this time around. They may be working on some border uh, road grading but a lot of what they're going to be doing will be behind the scenes inside the office. Access to the guardsmen lasted only minutes. A spokesman for the Border Patrol says they are down 200 people in El Centro. The guard will be going through orientation and then dispatched to monitor security cameras. Soldiers will maintain vehicles and handle paperwork to free up agents. Roughly 250 guardsmen have been called up in California. Governor Brown has authorized up to 400 California guardsmen. Close to 2,000 guardsmen have been called up nationwide as part of what Department of Homeland Security and the Pentagon are calling Operation Guardian Support. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. 
A long line of candidates will be asking for your vote this June, but many of them haven't always made it to the polls themselves. I recently spoke to KPBS reporter Claire Tregesser about candidates' voting records. So how did you obtain this information? I put in a request with the County Registrar of Voters. If you give them someone's address and birthday, they will give you back this form that has um, when the person first registered to vote in the county and what party they were registered with, and then a yes or no on whether they voted in all of the past elections. They, it should be said, don't tell you how the person voted. That's confidential. It's just a record of whether they voted or not. So today we're going to talk about the city council right. candidates and then later this week we'll talk about the county and congressional candidates. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, so in city council races there are four races, three with incumbents and then one an open seat. So I looked at three sitting council members and then everyone running against them and then everyone running for that open seat. So we can start with District 2, which covers Ocean Beach and Point Loma. The incumbent, Lori Zaff, missed four elections, a midterm primary in 1998 and three special elections. And those were for a city council race and a library bond. And of her opponents, Randy Hahn missed the most. He missed eight elections. And then Jordan Bean missed two, Jennifer Campbell missed one, Brian Pease missed one, and then Kevin Melton and Danny Smichowski missed none. So let's talk about District 4. All right, so there the incumbent Myrtle Cole missed no elections. Um, and then among her opponents, one person really stood out. Neil Arthur has voting records that go back to 2006, and he has missed every single election except the last 2016 general uh, presidential election. In fact, he didn't even vote in the special election for the council district that he's running to represent. And I contacted his campaign to ask why he missed so many elections and didn't hear back from them. And then um, among Cole's other opponents, Monica Montgomery missed four and Tony Villafranca missed 10 elections. What about the other council districts up for re-election? Okay, so in District 6, there the incumbent Chris Kate missed four. He didn't vote in the 2004 presidential race between George W. Bush and John Kerry, and he didn't vote in San Diego's 2005 special mayoral election when Donna Fry ran a write-in campaign against Jerry Sanders. And another interesting thing to note is that in 2006, Kate was registered with the American Independent Party, and then in 2008, he changed his registration to Republican. And I contacted his campaign multiple times about all this and didn't hear back from them. And then among his opponent, uh, Kevin Lee Egger missed five elections, Tommy Howe missed three, Matt Valenti missed one, and the registrar wasn't able to find records for his other opponent, opponent Jeremiah Blatter. How about District 8? So there, there's no incumbent, um, but there is a steep competition between who missed the most elections. Zachary Lazarus missed 17, including four presidential elections. And when we asked for a response, his campaign sent a statement that says he will work to implement policies that will maximize voter participation, including but not limited to automatic pre-registration and making election day a national holiday. Another candidate in that race, Antonio Martinez, missed 14 elections, including three presidential elections. And when we reached out for a response, he also sent a statement saying that he was inspired by Barack Obama in 2008, and after that, he became more active and involved. He said, quote, since then, like many San Diegans, I've missed a few special elections due to the demands of work and family. And then there are uh, two other candidates in that race. Vivian Moreno missed five elections, and Christian Ramirez missed one. Thank you, Claire. That is a lot of information. Yes, it is a lot. Um, we've posted everything online, all the elections that each candidate has missed, and then a statement if they sent them, and also including the county and congressional races. And you can find all of that at kpbs.org slash missed. Organizers of a community forum tonight say they're disappointed. Interim DA Summer Stefan has opted out of sharing the stage with her opponent, Genevieve Jones-Wright. But recently, our Jade Heinemann had a chance to speak with both candidates in the district attorney's race about where they stand on proposed legislation regarding officer-involved shootings.
It's right now when police shoot and kill someone in the course of their job. Those shootings are justified if they are objectively reasonable. Assemblywoman Shirley Weber has introduced a bill, uh, AB 931, that would only allow police to shoot if it's needed to prevent imminent and serious harm. It would also allow prosecutors to consider whether an officer's actions could have put them in danger. Do you support that, that bill? I am studying that bill. I have not formed an opinion. We are looking at every side of that bill. Um, the law that we have comes from the Supreme Court, and it comes from case law. So that is the law that we operate under, which is whether it is reasonable that there was a threat to safety um, or to others when officers shoot. Not whether it's an administrative question, but whether the officer committed a homicide. But in my job, no one is above the law. I've already, uh, as district attorney, charged a deputy sheriff with sexual misconduct and with acting improperly under color of authority, multiple felony charges. I've charged another police officer with fraudulent behavior. Each case is looked at, and under the law that we have, that's the law that I apply. And what are your thoughts on that, Genevieve? I believe that our state legislature should approve the bill. It should be passed. We're talking about a person who is an assembly woman, my assembly woman from San Diego, who understands San Diego and the problems that we are facing locally and statewide. So it's interesting for me to hear that my opponent wants to rely on case law that came from the Supreme Court in a case that did not come out of San Diego to then support that standard that is pretty much outdated and stands in the way of bringing justice to people who have been harmed by police officers. I would also like to say that my opponent's record of justifying these killings and these shootings by sheriff deputies and law enforcement officers belies her words. The DA's office has been a rubber stamp and officers are not held accountable under the law. We have a system in place in San Diego where officers are in fact above the law. We can take a look at how long it took for her to investigate and then to file charges of the deputy that she mentioned, Sheriff Deputy Fisher, and how long that was swept under the rug before anyone got involved, not just the DA's office, but also the sheriff's. And it was because of social media. It was because of petitions by the people who wanted to see action. But we, when we look at the numbers, 155 officer-involved shootings between 2005 and 2015, and all were justified. Yes, that was under Bonnie Dumanis's administration, but my opponent is a continuation of that administration. When you lump together four different shootings all in one press conference, and you approve those killings, even though one of the deputies who killed Jonathan Cornell the day that I announced my candidacy shot him at least 16 times where he had 22 bullet holes in his body and by accounts of witnesses had already surrendered and was lying prone on the ground. That same sheriff deputy killed another young man just 11 months before that. So we're seeing a pattern of killings and I have yet to hear the district attorney's office, even when they believe the killings are justified, talk about de-escalation. Why are we shooting so much? Why is shooting the go-to tactic? The people are ready for officers to be held accountable, to be trained better in racial bias. And that's something I'm not hearing from this particular district attorney. There's an obscure race on the ballot, county assessor slash recorder. In California, the Constitution requires each county have one. But what exactly does an assessor do? And who's running? KPBS reporter Claire Tregesser has some answers. The assessor and recorder job involves deciding how much property tax everyone pays, storing the county's public land records, and issuing marriage licenses and birth certificates. Matt Strabone is challenging the incumbent, Ernie Dronenberg. He says he knows he's not running for the most exciting t job title, but... I know that we're lacking in the leadership department in our office here, and I believe I could do a better job. And that's kind of the basis of a republic, right? If you think you can do a better job than the elected official, you should try to replace him. Incumbent Ernie Dronenberg has held the office since 2010. He says when he was elected, he focused on a culture of customer service, and it's paid off. We don't sell tires. We don't produce widgets. We provide great customer service. That's our product. That's what we do. So then I 
had everybody in the office, all 415, took a customer service training class. He says the office has received more than a 98% positive rating in customer service surveys and has a 4.5 star rating on Yelp. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. As we count down to the June primary, KPBS News will continue to reach out to candidates. You can see more of our election coverage at kpbs.org slash election. Every year, thousands of immigrants from across the globe leave behind the only life they know to make San Diego their new home. A new nonprofit program is asking the public to come up with ideas for making the community more welcoming. KPBS reporter Taryn Minto explores how they're making it happen. It's not easy, you know, the fact that we don't really speak English at the beginning when we're going to school. Congolese refugee Joseph Akiochi is a college student at San Diego City College. He came to San Diego in 2012 when he was 17 years old from a refugee camp in Tanzania. Most of my life, I grew up in a refugee camp for 15 years. Akiochi is one of about two dozen community members talking about how to help immigrants transitioning to new lives in San Diego. You know, just ask people three simple questions of, what are your hopes and dreams? Uh, what are some barriers you face? And what solutions do you want to see? Samuel Choi is the lead organizer of Welcoming San Diego, a coalition of public agencies and nonprofit organizations. What does a one-stop shop look like for community services, health, finance, housing, food? His goal is to create better support for immigrants like Akiochi and his family so they may more easily integrate and contribute in San Diego. So things are already existing, like what, do we, what can we do to either get those programs out to the communities that are not yet um, aware about these, or specific language groups, specific uh, ethnic groups that are uh, not being engaged. He says discussions around education are often raised because the events are held in school classrooms. But the forums also tackle topics of employment, public safety, and more. He says data is collected through the discussions at the meeting, but also through surveys. One is a quantitative one where it's just uh, 20 questions uh, ranging from, you know, how do you feel about access to health care or housing, um, or just simply how do, you, how do you feel safe, do you feel welcome in your neighborhood? So we're going to capture those um, to see if there's any trends in terms of demographics uh, of, you know, breakdown of refugees versus asylees versus immigrants or age. Choi will compile all of the input he collects into a final report due this fall. Barrier is the language. Uh, language access. He says the group is still figuring out what recommendations um, it will make to the city of San Diego. Okay, now we have this data, now we have all these uh, input from the community. How do we actually turn that into a report that is both aspirational but not too pie in the sky? In the meantime, the workshops may already be leaving an impact. But at my school, there are a lot of second generation students. 16 year old Maya Tipton says the conversations with newly arrived immigrants made her realize the welcoming role she can play in her own school. Yeah. The daughter of an immigrant says this especially applies to students who may also speak Japanese. As a high school student, I'm just into actually like going to like club events. Like I might be like, hey, join my club, you know. We, we're going to be talking about this and this. Like it's going to be so much fun. Like this is how you can get involved within our community and how you can share your ideas and you can say, oh, like come join the sport. They want to be able to support the family. Ikiochi says it's that kind of opportunity that helped him transition to San Diego from his years in the refugee camp. He struggled using English to build connections with his peers when he first arrived six years ago. Some of my friends, I asked them questions like, well, you guys, it's so hard for you guys to get a job. But a nonprofit running club in City Heights helped him connect a different way. We, we were all share is the common of like, all we all like had a passion of running. So we were also like, working together is, and that really brings us like a, like a family. Akiochi is now working to address language barriers for other refugees as a fellow with the local nonprofit Rise San Diego. I always take kids to the library to help them to read a book so and I put them together to read it to each other so they can understand the literature so they can be able to read to the parent letters they can be able to take the parent to hospital and a translator for them. I eventually was able to be first generation college student. The Welcoming San Diego initiative also comes from a RISE fellow, Samuel Choi. In America. He hopes it will lead to the creation of an immigrant serving city office. <laughs> Taryn Mento, KPBS News.
Two more forums are scheduled this month. You can go to kpbs.org for the details. Cow and Dow is a welcoming San Diego founder, which also supports City Heights coverage here at KPBS. I'm Judy Woodruff tonight on the News Hour. As a U.S. embassy moved to Jerusalem, more than 50 Palestinian protesters are killed along the Gaza border. We'll have the details at 7 right after Evening Edition on KPBS. Common dry weather is expected throughout the county with plenty of sunshine. Erin Calandra has the forecast. Well, I hope you enjoyed your day today. It was gorgeous outside, really. Temperatures not too hot, not too cold. Things are pretty quiet. Taking a look across the county right now, there is nothing on this radar. It is quiet. It is dry. We could use some of that wet weather, but it's going to stay to the north and to the east of us. And that's how it looks for all of the southwest. Things are quiet, dry, and uh in a drought, really. So taking a look at the temperatures for tonight, 58 degrees, those clouds, they'll be building. And when you wake up in the morning, still cloudy along the coast, but then by lunchtime, it's gonna be bright and sunny. So tonight in Oceanside, temperatures dipping to 51 degrees, Chula Vista at 56, Ramona a bit cooler, 47, and in the mountains at 43 in Mount Laguna. Now tomorrow, the high in Oceanside, 68, looking pretty great, San Diego at 67, Chula Vista as well, and in Borrego Springs, Springs. It is cooking at 92 degrees with blazing sunshine. We are in a stormy pattern on the east coast, but on the west coast, opposite story, it is just dry here in the southwest. The further north you go, we are going to see some showers. The plains are going to see some thunderstorms later on in this week. But for San Diego County, we certainly don't have to worry about that. Tuesday, 68 degrees, some sunshine. Clouds are going to be breaking up and clearing out throughout the week. And by the weekend, it's going to be great at 69 degrees with a few clouds and then brilliant sunshine for everyone in the interior areas. Just a bit warmer in the 70s all week and turning sunny for the weekend. Very pleasant conditions in the mountains in the 60s. If you like it cooler, we're there. That is the spot to be. It's going to be beautiful, though, nice and sunny and staying dry. And in the deserts, it is hot. Thursday, we do dip down to 89 degrees. That will be the coolest day of the week. Every other day, well, it's going to be in the 90s. It's also going to be awfully sunny out there. So make sure you're drinking plenty of water and put on that sunblock if you're planning on being outdoors. For KPBS News, I'm Erin Calandra. Ebony, back to you. A surplus of marijuana has pushed prices to record lows in Oregon, forcing nervous growers to look at alternative crops. Associated Press reporter Jillian Flaccus explains. This sputtering orange goo is turning out to be liquid gold for the cannabis industry in Oregon. This is the first step to harvesting cannabidiol, or CBD oil. Where was that plant with all the pollen on it? Maybe it's right here. An in-demand extract of the hemp plant. There we go. A cousin of marijuana that can sell for more than $10,000 per kilogram. Uh, you, you name it, somebody's putting CBD into it. Open his jaw a little bit. CBD oil is popping up in everything from dog treats to chocolate bars to lotions. Patrons at this bar in Los Angeles can order drinks with CBD. A surplus of marijuana in Oregon has driven pot prices to record lows. And now, many one-time marijuana growers are pivoting to hemp for the money that can be made in hemp-derived CBD, which doesn't come with a high. Seth Crawford breeds hemp plants that have a strong concentration of CBD and sells the seeds to farmers for as much as $1 each. He says the demand is staggering. Being non-psychoactive and yet still providing palliative care uh, makes it a, a very interesting substance and people are much more willing to try it. Proponents say CBD can help with everything from anxiety to chronic pain. The FDA is expected to approve the first drug derived from CBD for treatment of epilepsy next month. But other claims have not been substantiated, and experts caution that little is known about its effect on humans. Believe it or not, cannabidiol is still a Schedule One substance, just like cannabis. Uh, so it's very difficult to study cannabidiol in a university setting, um, you know, under controlled conditions, given that it is a Schedule One substance. But that isn't stopping Oregon's pot pioneers from going all in on hemp. Licenses to grow hemp have increased more than 20-fold since 2015. Come on in. Lauren Cruzy decided to open a CBD-only shop next door to his marijuana store after sales dropped. 
and he will grow 17 acres of hemp this summer too. For being part of the system that we came from, we were growing 140 to 150 plants a year. Um, and it was exciting, you know, it was a great time to be a part of it. But at this point, it's sort of, uh, we got to look at this new piece and we really believe that this is it. A complex cannabis landscape driving interest in hemp ever higher. Gillian Flackis, Associated Press, Oregon. Now, here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. On Morning Edition, the Hidden Brain podcast looks at how we raise our kids in the connection between music and babies. And on Midday Edition, get ready to ride what you need to know about Bike to Work Day tomorrow on KPBS Radio. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.